Hi, I'm Donna Batten with the Institute of Internal Auditors, and I'm here today interviewing Chris Wright, a Managing Director with ProTivity. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be here with you, Donna. So we will be talking about the revenue recognition standards today, and I first wanted to ask you, can you briefly describe what are the new standards for revenue recognition? Well, Donna, the new, the new standard is, is a, a product of the IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, and the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board in the U.S., working together on convergence. It's one of several projects uh, attempting to come up with one global accounting standard for revenue recognition. Uh, it'll require companies to look at, it, at things from a contractual uh, perspective, which is to look at the contracts they have with their customers, to understand what the price is overall, to understand what they have to deliver to their customers, whether it's goods or services, one thing or many things, then to allocate that price to those various parts if there is more than one, and then finally to recognize revenue as they deliver those goods or those services. Now for, for public companies and for many companies and industries that have rather simple revenue recognition models now, there may not be that much change. The, the Securities and Exchange Commission has Staff Accounting Bulletin 104, which requires persuasive evidence of an arrangement, which is a contract. It requires fixed or determinable pricing, which covers the pricing criteria. It requires that you deliver the goods or the services. And then it has an extra element, which is that you have a likelihood of getting paid. And so for many companies in, in certain industries where things are simple now, they'll be simple in the future. For other uh, companies and industries such as high technology or government contracting, there could be substantial change. Okay. So would you gauge the changes as, you know, as you were saying, significant for some and maybe not for others? How, how would you say that impact will be? Yeah, Don, I think it, it, it will depend on the industry and the complexity of the rules now. You know, the technology companies currently have a very complex set of standards that they have to meet to recognize revenue. That won't change for them, although it should be easier for them. Uh, companies that do government contracting or long-term contracting have a relatively simple model now and it might become more difficult for them. So it's really going to depend on companies doing a thorough analysis of how it applies to them and getting into the, into the details, if you will, sooner rather than later so that they don't either underestimate the complexity or overestimate the complexity because they run the risk of either doing too much too soon or too little too late. Well, given the changes then in the new rules, how is this going to impact internal audit and especially their interactions with the audit committee, even external audit? So, Don, it's a great question. A, uh, as many internal audit departments work with the external auditors on audit support, and right now they're used to a, a complex but finite set of rules. And so they work with the external auditors or with the company to, to demonstrate some evidence to the external auditors around following what could be argued as now a checklist. It's tried and true rules. Uh, in the future, because this is a subjective and more principles-based standard, they may have to interact with the auditors in a way where they're demonstrating how they've audited not the compliance with rules, but the exercise of judgment. And that may require more than, that, that doesn't lend itself really well to a checklist. That lends itself more to memoranda and discussions with conclusions and perhaps back, a bit of back and forth, a bit of give and take, and achieving consensus on the front end about what you're going to do so that, that at the end no, nobody's surprised with the outcome. Exactly. And, you know, what are some of those key risks that everyone really needs to watch out for? So there's a, as I mentioned, the first risk I mentioned already, which is the risk of either overestimating complexity or underestimating complexity or overestimating simplicity, to state it differently. Uh, this, the second risk would be that companies look at this as a project to become compliant with the new standard without creating a process for maintaining sustainable compliance with the new standard, and such that every year is the first year. And so they really need to plan uh, for the future and make sure that they embed some of these changes in their processes and controls, which lends itself to internal audit changing test plans, and then maybe using different skill sets and different people to do the auditing. There's another risk, which is the possibility of this standard being delayed is, is, is uh, pretty real. And so if it's delayed, let's say a year, and we find out later this year, and companies wait until then to take action, then they'll have wasted the year. And so there's a risk that if there's a delay, companies take uh, advantage of all that time to delay rather than to become uh, more ready or be in a better position to comply and, and maybe have that project that leads to a process as opposed to the project that leads to a project every year.